Well, welcome, everyone. Greetings. Hello. We are episode number four, The Anvil and Hammer. And today we are talking about a very serious issue. We're going to be examining our blind spot, which is the murder of babies in the womb through the process, which is culturally known as abortion. Quite a grim subject, but it's very important that we examine this and that we we, we know about this. We know how to respond to this biblically. We have a, a friend with us today called Christian Hacking, and we met him in Ireland in a Christian union and university, and yeah, he's been a great friend, and he's very involved in this, has a lot to say. He works with a great organization called Abort 67, and they have a lot of scientific information about the unborn. I'll put some links in the description of this podcast so that you can check those out after this. The reason why we're interviewing Christian is because he works for Abort 67, so he has been trained to interact with the various different types of people that he would meet on the pro-abortion side. I can completely sympathize with people who are apathetic about the issue because up until a very recent point, I would have been not apathetic in in my words, but certainly in my actions apathetic. I'm not doing much about it. So that's why we have Christian on today is to challenge ourselves as well as to hopefully lovingly challenge others, whether you're Christian or not, to consider what is happening at the moment and what people are calling for in Ireland and what is going on today in the UK. Great. So we will uh, get into our interview with with Christian and I hope that this uh, encourages you and gives you lots to think about. So let's start. My name is Christian Hacking. I am 27 years of old. And yeah, I guess I, I work as a pro-life um, advocate or activist or educator around England, but mainly in London. How did I get involved in this work? It, the answer is um, very unwillingly. A quick Google search will show you how unpopular our work is. Um, try and post something pro-life on Facebook and you will find yourself being emotionally crucified um, by, by your granny turned troll. Yeah, it was a very unwilling career move on my part, but I I think I'd been asking a question for a number of years, which was, what is the blind spot of our generation? Just in the same way that cars have blind spots um, and people, individuals have blind spots, is it possible for a generation to have a blind spot? And so we, when we look back to kind of South Africa with apartheid, we see that the church was not, the Dutch Reformed Church was not only not doing anything about apartheid, but it actually um, approved of it or found theological justifications for it. Um, when we think of Nazi Germany and how did the Holocaust happen, well, we read more deeply and we realize that the established church in Germany was frightened of Hitler and didn't want to stand up against him, hence why Bonhoeffer and gang went off and formed the Confessing Church. And even in our own country, I think of Royal Britannia, Britannia rules the waves, Britain will never, ever be made slaves. True, um, we weren't, but it didn't mean we didn't make over a million slaves um, on the African coast. And again, sadly, we see the church was all too involved in the slave trade. Its interests are far too tied up. Of course, individuals would have said, oh, personally, I don't have slaves, or personally, I'm against the slave trade. But it, the slave trade was seen as being so um, interwoven in the daily lives of, of British people that to think of a slave-free culture was almost impossible for people at the time. So questions like that have been irking on my mind. I thought, well, if previous generations have blind spots, then surely we must do too. And so for about five years, I investigated various different things, looked into global warming a bit, looked into homelessness, looked into educational disadvantagedness, I looked into um, the ongoing problem of slavery and sex trafficking and cyber slavery, which is now rife around the world, and 145.8 million um, slaves are still thought to be worldwide. But the thing about slavery is I thought people recognize it to be wrong now, you know, um, and that for me made me think, no, maybe maybe that's not the biggest blind spot. And then um, a friend of mine from Ireland, a GP down in Kilkenny, started sending me emails about the abortion question and specifically around drugs and, uh, you know, the morning after pill and how does that work and does that stop 
pregnancy from happening or does it kill something that's been formed by pregnancy these kinds of questions and then this snowballed into bigger questions of abortion and um, Ireland abortion is currently illegal and huge international pressure is put on Ireland to kind of modernize you know to, to get with the rest of the world at killing their children so this question really drew me in and time and time again I kept on emailing them back saying please stop emailing me these links you know I find this stuff all very scaremongering and frightening and leaves me with a bad taste in the mouth but time and time again he just would write back saying but is it true like are these facts real are these numbers real and lo and behold they are and they are ginormous they are in their hundreds of thousands in the UK and suddenly and um, very unwillingly I realized gosh I think this is it I think this is the blind spot of our time that from the moment of conception, it's scientifically correct to say a distinct living and whole human being comes into existence. It's very hard to argue against that on scientific terms. And yet, we somehow in our society dispatch of them 800 times a day. Uh, and that was very problematic for me. Um, I don't judge our culture for being behind on it. I was myself. I, you know, I, I simply see myself as someone who's been rudely awakened from a from a deep and apathetic sleep, and and I hope to treat people compassionately as I try and wake them up to this injustice as well. I mean, I I first saw graphic images of abortion victims when I, I believe I was 22 years old. I didn't put any calories into fighting this injustice until I was 26 years old I believe and so I feel like the Lord was really kind to me and really gracious and really gentle with me you know that was kind of a three three year period by which it took me to realize the injustice to get active on it and uh, and so I seek to try and be that that generous and gentle to people I engage with but but yes as Wilberforce once said you can look the other way, but you can never again say you didn't know. So if you're listening to this podcast now, I'm sorry, I've kind of ruined your life. Now you know the figures. Listen on if you want to hear some more convincing stuff. But but actually, yeah, you can't look the other way now. Um, if it's true that the pre-born child is a human being, then our culture is culpable of one of the worst mass genocides known in history. And the church must do something about it. So... I believe there's 190,000 children murdered in the womb in the UK each year. It's, a, it's around that, 190, so it's 180, 190,000. And the last year, I think it was 184,000. Well, yeah. What's the pandemic of this in our culture? Yeah, absolutely. So, so abortion was introduced in 1967 by a guy called David Steele as part of this abortion act it came on the cusp of lots of kind of liberation of sexual ideals suicide was decriminalized homosexual marriage was legalized to a degree or certainly the criminalization of homosexuals was 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 removed and then we had this this abortion act that came through and and initially the abortion act was designed as a kind of compassionate concession to extreme cases of rape of incest of of when a child is so disabled in the womb that they're going only going to live a few weeks or days something called fatal fetal abnormality or ffa and yet the terms that it was constructed in by clever people who, who, who were committed to abortion have allowed it to become abortion on demand. Last year, nine children in the UK were aborted simply because they have a cleft lip. We all know people who've had cleft lips. We know we kind of get post through our doors of the smile train. We know it's a very curable disorder. We know it doesn't affect personality or intellect or social abilities one bit. Yet nine children last year were killed for that. Over 3,000 children were killed last year because they were disabled. I am a disabled man in a wheelchair. Of course, disability um, comes with economic burdensomeness and you know, you have to buy all kinds of equipment into houses to equip, allow disabled people to live. You know, you may have to liberate them to give them adapted vehicles to drive around, etc. But, but actually, it's so important to have disabled people in society. I often think a disabled person doesn't need to really like be very good when they get to work. They just need to get to work <laughs> um, and they kind of encourage the workforce, you know. And that's certainly my experience as a disabled user on buses. People just, they like having you around, you know. 
and yet 3,000 are killed simply through disability. And this, mainly the largest proportion of these happen in London, so 43,000, uh, 42,061 children were aborted in London last year. The great majority of these happen in the first 13 weeks, so around 85% happen in the first 13 weeks, and then about 9% 9, 9 happen plus 13 weeks, and around 8% or or 1.5% of the total happen post 20 weeks, which people often say, hey, you know, late term abortions, that's really scary, isn't it? But that accounts for such a small proportion. And you're right, 1.5% is a small proportion of uh, 190,000 children. But when you do the mass, you know, that still works out to um, over 1,000 children killed at, at a stage where they definitely feel pain, they're moving, they're expressing gross amounts of human attributes that make them totally recognisable as a human being, although I would argue that's ultimately not just what makes us human. So, yeah, the figures you cited at the start, I mean, when you engage with figures on this, you sometimes get, people have different figures, and the reason for that is because it's about who you're including in your figures. So, for example, the UK figure of 180,000 that you quoted last year is the figure of UK residents having abortions in the UK. If you tag on international residents, so the 3,000 and um, I think it's 3,600 around that figure that came from Ireland to have their abortions in our country, then you get up to about 190,000. 406 is the total number of abortions that happened last year in the UK. I mean, some of these large stadiums in London, football stadiums, you know, they contain 40, 50,000 people. I mean, we're talking nine or 10 of them. If they collapsed whilst the stadium was full at some, you know, final soccer final, you know, it, there would be national mourning. You know, the whole country would be brought to a standstill everyone would have a story to tell about someone that they lost. Or even if a child uh, was run over, they were left on the street and a car was run over them, there'd be national outroar. And then there, you would guarantee there'd be a bunch of laws passed and politicians standing up speaking, trying to pass laws to protect you know, children on the road safety. Yet there's 190,000 yeah. children being torn apart, killed in the womb each year. And there's silence. It's, it's shocking. Sure, sure. And uh, yeah, and I mean, it's there is abortion, unlike so many other laws, is just so full of contradictions, you know, that if you want a child, and somebody attacks you and causes you to have a miscarriage, then that person gets done with something called child destruction, which is akin to murder, basically, and you get thrown in jail. Um, however, if someone doesn't want a child at the same gestation can go to a facility and have that child injected, dismantled, pulled out, sucked out, poisoned, whatever it might be, whatever, depends on the surgical method you use to remove that child. And yet that's regarded as choice. With our, with our regard to disability, as soon as you're out of the womb, you know, we will do anything for you. We will, we will build a ramp into the eighth story of your house if necessary. <laughs> you know, we'll run the Olympics for you. We will get well aggy at anyone who seeks to stand in your way as a disabled person, as being a kind of barbaric, backward um, stance. Yet, right up until birth, it is permissible to kill a disabled person because they have a disability, as limiting as cleft lip. I mean, I, you know, and, you, and when you really push it, the question is, what does six inches passing down the birth canal do to change the legal and human status of that child. I mean, it's totally illogical. And yet we just sit with this law the whole time. Another example I could use is University College London Hospital, I believe. I always get that order wrong, so forgive me if it's um, some other um, ordering. In their neonatal units, they're saving children at 22 weeks. So these children are tragically being born premature. They have specific teams and specific equipment to keep that child alive, to nurture them back to full health and and to you know to normal adulthood and yet in the same hospital facility you know potentially on the other floor or potentially down the corridor other people are going for elective surgical abortions of children at 23 weeks or or beyond you know i mean what does it say of our healthcare that in one room we're saving life and i believe that is health as the hippocratic oath defines to cause no harm yet in the next door room we're taking life 
claiming it is a safe medical procedure, claiming it is access to health care. Yeah, it, the, it's all over the shop. We, um, and, sorry to interrupt you, Christian. Yeah, no, absolutely go for it. We personally experienced the side effects of abortion being allowed in this country when I was in my first trimester. Here, they're fantastic with your maternity care once you're after 20 weeks because I think that's when they, you know, they, they think, okay, your baby is, you know, safe now. Looks like your baby, there's no chance, or sorry, a lower chance of you having a an early miscarriage now. So that's when they really, I suppose, they, they really pick up on your care. But when we first arrived here in the UK, we were here about six, six days. And I, I'll i always remember it was the 5th of November. So I'm never going to forget that. Guy Fox Day. And I was here alone and I would have been about 10 weeks pregnant. And I had a really big bleed. And Sean was away. He was at a conference. I had to get some church members to try and bring me to A&E. We went to a local hospital. And I was shocked at how I was treated while I was there. I I was brought in to be assessed by a nurse to see how extreme uh, the circumstance was. And he asked me, I, I not to be too graphic, but I was still bleeding at this stage. It, and I was, it was white as a sheet. I was in shock. I, I was terrified that I'd lost the baby. A very unsympathetic man. And when he asked me how far along I was, I said I was about 10 weeks. And he said to me, oh, you're only 10 weeks. As if it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter if you've miscarried your child, you're only 10 weeks. And I think it just shows you the culture around it because then we had a 10 week scan or was it 11 week scan? It was 11 week scan. And the amount of detail was phenomenal. You could see his fingers, you could see his heart beating very clearly. You could see him moving. You could see his spine, his brain, because as they moved the, the what's it called sound, the, the yeah the ultra the ultrasound as they moved the ultrasound sound around the womb, you can see different levels of detail, and it was phenomenal. And to think that that's the culture, that's the mentality around such a precious little life is is, is utterly shocking. Yeah, and you know, thankfully. Praise God, he was okay, but they didn't scan me straight away when I think they could have. You know, they made me wait. A doctor told us we'd, for one thing, we'd most likely miscarried. So they were great with my care. They they checked to make sure I was okay. And once they were convinced I was fine, they didn't care about the baby. They didn't try and see, is the baby in distress they didn't try and they didn't send me for an emergency scan when they could have they made me wait three days with a potentially carrying a potentially dead baby for the next scan and thankfully he was okay and it was just a it was a large area of hemorrhaging right underneath the womb so it was a complete miracle because we were praying and praying that he would be okay and praise god he was but uh, it was just a, a huge shock, the the care here. And then things completely changed after 20 weeks. You know, after 20 weeks, I was getting full on care. Their attitude towards my pregnancy completely changed as if now they were saying, oh, it's a baby. I think one of the problems is with the, the term abortion. Because Christian, if I was to say to you, I'm going to abort you, you go, what? That doesn't even make grammatical sense. What are you talking about? What, you need to pull out of the Skype call early? <laughs> yeah, you only abort impersonal things. It doesn't make sense. You can't abort something which has personhood. You say, I'm going to go and abort the spin cycle on my washing machine. Or I'm going to abort a project proposal for work. You you abort impersonal things. You cannot abort things which have personhood. So I think when we use the term abortion, we are in a sense already conceding that that which is in the womb doesn't have personhood. So I think we should call it what it is in reality. And I think we should call it murder. We should say, why are you for baby murder? And if they contend with you on that point, well, then you're getting straight to the issue. It then gives us a foundation in which we can now get to the Christian gospel, which is where we want to take people. We want to engage this cultural issue so that we can point them to hope, that there's hope for your sin, there's hope for your, your murder in Jesus Christ. 
Well, I, I mean, to go back slightly, Sarah, I'm so sorry to hear of your experience. And yeah, it's dreadful that you're treated that way. But especially when the majority of children are being killed around 10 to 13 weeks, mm -hmm. of course, there's a total medical reluctance to really want to acknowledge and invest in them. And it's just it just flows from the inconsistency there. And, and Sean, you're quite right that the whole debate is full of euphemisms that we call it an embryo, a clump of cells, a fetus. We don't refer to it as a child or a baby or as a human being, because we know that with correct terminology with truth comes responsibility I mean fortunately there are people in the system my wife had a few complications and we had to go for emergency scans and we had a midwife at you know 15 16 weeks being like oh look at your little baba look at them little you know and yeah. and that was so encouraging and and heartwarming and don't worry your baby's okay you know kind of thing but again you know that doctor will have to kind of change their hat if somebody comes into the room who is being counseled towards an abortion etc and we know that when people are treated for abortion that they don't get shown the ultrasounds you know and we know that perhaps one of the reasons why abortions are falling just slightly in the last five six years is because of the advance of photography um, to show people what children look like moving on to your point Sean yes I, I, I quite I quite agree I think the abortion debate I mean we need to get active on this for two reasons. And the first reason is simply to save lives. Proverbs 24, 12 says, warn those being led away to death, restrain those being led away to death, you know. And so we have this biblical mandate just to stop people from killing the innocent. So that's one part of it. But I think you, you see correctly that actually this does lead to a really good gospel opportunity that if anything proves the depravity of man and the depravity of society is the abortion debate. Because what do we do? We judge other cultures, um, General Mao, um, Stalin, Hitler. We judge them for their horrific treatment of human beings and the way that they dehumanize them. They make them into rats, to cattle, and yet then they do what they want with them. And yet in our culture, what do we do with the preborn child? Well, we dehumanize it. We don't make it into a fetus and then we, we kill it. And we don't even call it killing. We call it terminating. Any genocide begins with the alteration of words. You win the battle for language, then you can act according to the new language you set. And, and as Christians, we need to be the first people to, to really call things by their proper name. I guess there's a disagreement. I personally, I know you're going to push back on this, Sean, but uh, I personally wouldn't call it murder. I certainly wouldn't call, I, wouldn't, I might accuse an abortionist of uh, murdering a child who, especially if the abortionist knows that the child is a human being. I feel like so many women are being lied to. They're being told that it's a clump of cells. They've been told that this is a simple medical procedure that they can do on a lunch break. They just take a few pills. They just have a heavy bleed. You know, it's all over. Back to normal is what they're told. Mm. But we know that procedure, especially years down the line, has a huge psychological effect on women. That they, they know that there was something special growing inside them. They know it wasn't just like a two for a tumour or a you know growing mole. They know that there was something unique about what they did. And often women self-recognise themselves to be mothers and the child to be a child. Women talk about, I've killed a child. And mm -hmm. the abortion industry says, tries to comfort them and says, no, 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 you just killed a clump of cells. You yeah. just killed a non sentient fetus. And we know that, you know, uh, we, we believe very strongly that the woman is the second victim of abortion. That women carry those scars for a long time and often affects the way mothers relate to future children. Abortion also promotes sexism because it allows men to fill up women with children and then be totally unaccountable. Yeah. You know, and often we they talk about abortion being pro-choice, but we speak to women on the doors of abortion clinics. And we remember one tear jerking incident where we tried to speak to an Asian girl just before she went to an abortion. And what were her final words? They were, I don't have a choice. So fascinating that in a, an abortion culture, we talk about preserving the rights and choices of women, that actually people don't have a choice in this. I suppose, let me just clarify with why I desire to call it murder. I don't think we should be name calling necessarily. And I think we just, just like how an adult would groom a child and then sexually abuse them, sexually assault them. You know, I'm not going to say to that child or that young person who's being groomed, oh, you're a pervert, or I, I recognize that an adult has come in and has lied, manipulated, and abused their position of authority over that vulnerable person. But I would certainly call 
the the adult who's grooming this child a pervert and uh, call them to repentance. So I think it's the same way where you have individuals who are pushing young people to get abortions. I'd certainly call them murderers. And for women who are treating abortion, like they know, they know all the logic, they know all the arguments, and they're choosing to ignore that and still have abortions. They are certainly mm-hmm. murderers. And the thing is, sure. it's to, to address it in that capacity and not to name call. We don't want to name call. We just want to point out that Look, this is sin. It's the violation of the sixth commandment. God hates hands that shed innocent blood, and you must repent and turn to Christ. Otherwise, God's wrath and vengeance will come upon you. Sure. No, I, and I quite agree. And I think not only need, does the church need to wake up to this injustice and start doing stuff, something about it, but the church also needs to be the first place that pioneers post abortive help and mm. post abortive counseling it's happening in uh, very rarely across the uk and very few centers are they doing this and doing it well but the church needs to be the first place that really pulls back the stigma on abortion one in three women by the age of 45 have one abortion one in four pregnancies each year ends in an abortion everyone is affected by this inside and outside the church so the church needs to be a place that says helps these women and so to use your example, though, this is the crucial thing, which is if a woman comes into your church and the gospel has been preached, the Holy Spirit is convicting her of her sin and she confesses to someone that she's had an abortion. and She is self-identifying as a murderer. Don't tell her she's not. Mm. Don't tell her. Don't tell her for one reason or another. She made an awful decision and that she, you know, that that she is not a murderer because we know that actually all of us are responsible for killing Christ. It was our sin that held him there until it was accomplished. What excites me about the abortion debate is it gives us an opportunity to fully give people full grace, not this kind of skimmed, cheap version that we so often give people to say, oh, no, you're not a bad person. You're not a murderer. You, You know, you just made a hard decision at the time. That was right for them, you know. We can be people who said, no, we are more broken than we ever realize we make decisions that are so selfish and so short-sighted that they as a lot of our decisions take life and and actually the only place where we can find hope and healing for post-abortive is at the cross of christ because it's the only image that is bloody enough and grotesque enough and dark enough to really be able to touch and reach those people who have been in those places and and of course, you know, by his wounds we are healed. That that through through the cross, you know, we have hope for post-abortive women that they they needn't be criminalised for their decision. That they can find forgiveness. That they can find redemption. There's also an element where Jesus taught that if you hate your neighbour, you have murdered in your heart. So it's to say that yes, you've murdered your child, but I I also am a murderer. I've hated my neighbour before. So. Yeah. You're, you're not saying it as a, a hypocritical way or as a judgmental. You're just stating what the Bible says, and then you're pointing yeah. them to Jesus. You brought up a really good point uh, when I was talking to you once where you said that you show graphic images of victims who have been murdered through the process of abortion publicly, and one justification for that is because we see the crucifixion of Jesus was a very public event and God chose to have a very graphic depiction of what sin looks like and this is what it costs so if you could comment on that it'd be helpful absolutely I'd love to I mean we deal with often in a Christian's journey when they can be persuaded biblically that the killing of the pre-born is is abhorrent in the eyes of God when they can see that John the Baptist worshipped Jesus in a zygotic stage in Luke 1, when they can read with open eyes Psalm 53 or Psalm 1539 and realize that the preborn child is a human being, they often think, okay, I'm pro-life. And But then they would say something like, but I'm not like those American extremists who have their images. You know, I'm not like, you know, I'm not like those people. You know, because actually Jesus is a God of love and compassion and grace. And often we have to contend against Christians who say that it is unchristlike to show an image of an abortion victim. To them, I say, how well do you know Christ, (laughs) please? Mm -hmm. Um, Because really, this is a man whose greatest act of love was to be crucified on the busiest day of the Jewish calendar, and for the whole world to see. And Paul writes that this did not happen in a corner. 
all tucked away behind a closed door, kind of one at a time, come in and see this. This happened openly and publicly so that everyone could see. And it's a and it's a horrific thing because it shows us the depth of man's sin that Jesus had to come and do that. But it's a glorious thing because it says that Jesus loves us enough to come in to tell us the truth and to provide a way out. If you want to engage in a theological debate about graphic images, you're not going to win simply because the cross is a graphic image. It convicts us, but it also darts us on our journey of of hope and redemption. So, so yeah, we 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 think the use of graphic images is highly important in this debate. It's it's a witness to society to say this is what we're doing. It's it's trying to show people God's heart on the matter to say what you are doing in secret behind closed doors in abortion clinics. This is what it looks like. Jesus even says that he says, when the final days come, I will take what you whisper in the upper room and I will herald it from the rooftops. We're trying to do exactly like that in our work. Another theological justification we use is from Ephesians 5, which says, have nothing to do with the shameless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Francis Schaeffer, he wrote, every abortion clinic should have a plaque on it saying, opened with the full permission of the church. Mm -hmm. Because actually these clinics are everywhere and the church is doing nothing about them. As Christians, we need to expose the shameful deeds of darkness. You know, we need to shine light on what's going on. And and until we do, culture won't change. And we know that because guess who else used graphic images to make their points? The great missionary, William Carey, stopped widow burning by the etchings of what happened. Congolese genocide was stopped by Christians who showed pictures of what was really going on. Wilberforce and James Thomas Clarkson um, in the abolition of the slave trade famously used images to show what was going on behind, far away in the West Indies. They brought it home so that people could see. And Martin Luther King Jr., of course, he wasn't against violent acts against people, but he didn't mind putting grannies into harm's way because he knew when a granny got hit by a racist policeman, people changed their minds. Another amazing example would be Emmett Till, the Chicago black boy. Um, he was taken away. He was brutally murdered. His body was thrown into a local river. When his body was taken back, it was sent to his mother in Chicago. And the police said, look, don't don't make much of the body. It's very disfigured. But the mother said, no, I want people to see what racism really looks like. And so she bravely did an open casket at the Chicago funeral, this bloated body which uh, with a bullet hole in the head. Emmett Till's picture of him as a handsome 14-year-old was on the lid of the coffin. But America was forced to confront the reality of its racism. And, and that event is said to be the first big media campaign of and the civil rights movement. And so when people say don't use images, one thing we can say right from the off is that Jesus isn't on your side and history isn't on your side. You mustn't think that to change minds successfully, you're going to be popular. Jesus famously said, no servant is greater than their master. If they're going to persecute me and mock me, then they're going to persecute and mock you too. If they're going to kill me, they'll kill you too. And yet, so often as Christians, we think we found a better route than Jesus, that we found a way of being Christ-like without suffering like he did, without being maligned like he did. And, and really, it's not biblical, and we're missing out on a whole bunch of fellowship of sharing with him in his sufferings. And uh, yeah, it's the way to live. It's painful, but it's wonderful. So you work with an organization called Abort 67, and you have yeah. lots of public displays where you engage with people. Could you just give an example of what is the most common objection you have, and how do you respond? Or what is the, the most common argument for the pro-murder side, the pro-abortion side, and how would you answer that objection? Sure. So we do displays around the UK. We're actually midway through an awakening tour, which is taking images around the cities of the country, Leeds, Birmingham, Manchester, Cardiff. They're actually in Cardiff today. I'm going to Oxford and to Liverpool in the next month or so. And we put up these images. We put warning signs left and right and across the road so that anyone of a fragile disposition doesn't have to see the image. We contact the police. So it's all totally transparent. We're not a protesting group. We're an educational group. Um, so and when we do these images, yeah, it's not long before you get people coming straight at you. And one of the greatest objections you ever hear is that's not a human being. That's not a child. And which we say, why? Well, why is it not a child? And then basically people have a whole set of different reasons as to why preborn children are not children. The four main ones of them you get is size, 
level of development, environment, and dependency. Now, conveniently, they spell SLED. It's really easy to remember. But these are the four main arguments people will use to try and persuade you that it's not a human being. If it's not a human being, you can do what you want with it. So take, for example, size. Let's say it's not a human being because look how big it is. I mean, it, you know, how can that be a human? To which you say, OK, so what is it about size that makes us more or less human, right? So a two-week-old child is less big than a one-year-old child. Is it more OK to kill a two-week-old than a one-year-old? They say, no. You say, why not? And they go, because it's both human. <laughs> so, and you, so what you're doing is you're, you're taking the argument that they use to justify killing a pre-born child, and you just apply it to a born child. And it's a technique called trotting out the toddler. There's a guy called Scott Klusendorf who, who explains it much better than me. So let me do another example. So let's do level of development. So you say, they say, that's not a human being. And you say, why is it not a human being? And they say, well, it's not developed. To which you say, OK, well, um, I have with me a two-year-old child and they've still got milk teeth and they're not sexually mature and their bones aren't fully grown and they're, they're still learning lots at school. It's, they're still developing, right? OK, yeah, they're developing. Well, would it be okay for me to kill them because they're not fully developed, say, like a 25-year-old adult? No, of course not. You can't do that. Why? Well, why not? Well, because they're, they're human beings, to which you pose the question. So what is the difference between that and the pre-born child? Could I add as well, because, you know, we don't just live by ourselves. We live in a society that we're dependent on the milkman to bring milk to the shop so we can have milk in our cereal. So if I was to take you and put you in a desert naked, how long would you survive? You know, so we're dependent. We're dependent on other people. So I think you can approach it that way as well and bring it back to them. Well, you're dependent on people. I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the four, that's the fourth main argument people use. And the whole dependency argument is totally ridiculous. You know, I'm married, 27. I'm in a wheelchair. I'm absolutely dependent on my wife just for her love and her listening ear and her care. I'm absolutely dependent on my mother, my parents, who still help me out financially, believe it or not, being a pro-life Educator isn't isn't the most lucrative career around. <laughs> yeah, I mean the dependency the dependency question is totally farce. You know, people say, well, it's attached to the mother and by the umbilical cord, that must make it more dependent. So, you know, what is it about our humanity that changes whether we're fed through the stomach or in the mouth? You know, for example, I've, I'm a disabled man in rehab. I made numerous friends. Some of my friends can't eat through their mouth. They have what's they have special stints that go straight into their side. They they get given this kind of pasty mix of just pure nutrients with no taste, and it just goes straight into their small intestine, and, they, and their small intestine tries to digest it. Are they less human because that they can't eat through their mouth? Like absolutely not. Why? Because what makes us humans isn't how we eat. What makes us humans is our genetics, um, and most importantly, what makes us humans is that God has put His image into us that we're made in the image of God and that he puts his spirit into us that we may breathe his life. Um, in another huge one, they say they're not human because they're not conscious. So I say, well, every time I go to sleep at night, do I become less human? You know, <laughs> you know at night, it, at night is our society full of subhuman beings that, you know, you know, if you accidentally stamp on a sleeping person and kill them, you know, the court of law says, well, to be honest, at that point in time, they weren't really human. You know, um, you didn't wake them up whilst you stood on them, did you? No. Brilliant. Nope, sorry. Not to say that. No. Quitted. Out you go. <laughs> so there's another one you probably hear a lot is, well, what about rape? And this is, I always found this argument very strange because I don't see how the crimes of a father affect the, the life of the child. But how would you respond when someone says, yeah, well, in the cases of rape? Well, so, so, when, so when dealing with that objection, one thing you have to decide immediately is whether it's a genuine question coming from a compassionate place that is actually concerned about, you know, an underage mother that may be raped, or, and that is kind of what you would call an inquirer, or whether that person is actually using rape as a smokescreen to push their own abortion agendas. And so a simple question you can ask to try and decide whether they're in one or two of these categories categories is if you say to them, okay, just for the purposes of this conversation, if I was to say that abortion should be wrong except for the case of rape, would you agree with my position? Hmm. And if they say yes to that question, then you you probably know that you're dealing with someone who who's just genuinely concerned about 
a mother. Now, I think their concerns are inaccurate and they need to be reasoned with on those demands. But but there is it's coming from we have to give them their credit. It's coming from an OK place, you know. But there's another person who who actually they ask the rape question. They say, well, what about rape? What about abortion for the case of rape? And you say to them, OK, so for the case of rape, if I allowed abortion, would you ban all other abortions? And they say, no, of course not. Yeah. And so then you say to them, OK, so are you using a rape objection of which there are women who have been raped, underage women who have been raped, are you using that objection in order to crowbar your abortive argument? Because if so, you, how dare you use that poor victim as a kind of political tool in your argument? Um, so that's the first thing you need to decide is where they're coming from. And you need to have wisdom about this. And this is why, as Christians, we're very well positioned with this stuff, because we, we need to have just wisdom to know who we're dealing with. And don't you don't want to waste your time on a crusader? Like a crusader cares for they don't care for the preborn, they don't care for the rape victim and the mother. They just think abortion's a good thing, and they just need to be hemmed in by the law, basically. And so the inquirer a question I would often ask is I would say how many people are involved in a rape, and what should the punishment be for the people involved in a rape? And so I, I try and tease it out of them and you kind of get the fingers out and they say, OK, well, the, obviously the mum's been raped. And I say, well, what, what punishment should they get? And they say, oh, none at all. I mean, she's just been raped. And I'm like, great, we're in total agreement about that. I don't think rape women should be punished for being raped. Not like, not like in some Middle Eastern cultures. Absolutely not for that. OK, what about the rapist? What punishment do you think they should get? And people tend to be quite moderate, actually, in British society. And then they say, well, a good life sentence. Or if you're talking to some, some quite liberal person, they say, well, it might not be his fault that he raped someone, to which you kind of push and play with them on that. But then thirdly, you say, is there anybody else involved in the rape? And they may not get there immediately, but you say, well, if there's a pre-born child, I mean, is that, is that another party in this whole rape scenario? And they'll say yes. And then you pose exactly the same question that you have for the first two groups, which is you say, what punishment should they get because if it's abortion you're giving them a death sentence in a way that actually most people don't agree is appropriate for the rapists themselves mm. and often i feel that posing it that way being really patient and gentle and working through those options really gets people to consider oh wow you know and it's what we call in our work putting a pebble in someone's shoe they might not turn around on the spot but they're like oh that's that's confronting, but that actually I think it's more appropriate to give a death sentence to the innocent victim conceived of rape, who had nothing to do, didn't choose the mother or the father or the circumstances by which they're born. And yet, yeah, I think they should deserve a stricter punishment than the rapists themselves. And that is a really helpful question that gets to the heart of the matter, which is what is the preborn child? Is it a human being? I mean, there's, a, there's some beautiful books out there. There's a book called Startling Beauty, and which tells the story of a mother who was raped under extremely awful circumstances and chose to keep her child. There's a story that isn't told very regularly, certainly not by the media, who are often committed to abortion. But actually, when women decide to keep the children conceived of rape, they have an opportunity to love that child in a way that they weren't loved in the in the way that that child was made they have an opportunity to 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 change you know generational cycles of depravity and ungodliness and abandonment you know when when that person who committed the rape and has has done his worst and then suddenly this this child is loved and enjoyed and um taught in the ways of god and yeah, I mean, it's totally unimaginable for our culture, those people who keep children conceived of rape. But we also know on the, on the other side, it just compounds the problem. When you, when you add another act of violence to a rape circumstance, the violence of killing the child conceived of rape, it only compounds the problem. And the other one, something we haven't mentioned this whole time, is adoption. Like, why the heck is adoption so stigmatised in our culture? Adoption is the solution to abortion. And yet people, mothers assume it's somehow more degrading and more shameful to put your child up for adoption than it is to have them dismantled in the womb. I mean, the church has to be the first to respect women that go for adoption. We shouldn't shame the single mum on a council estate who, who gives their child up for adoption. We should praise them, saying that is a far better solution. For the Christian, adoption is a wonderful example of the gospel. We have been adopted by God into his family. So how better to live out the implications of the gospel message than to adopt a child? Absolutely. And we, we, think, we think theology is just book reading. 
rubbish. The theology is is living it out. And yeah, if you adopt a child, your theology on 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 biblical adoption, as written about in Romans, will 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 come into whole new um, illumination. Like, and and yet, you know, these Christian families are so dead set on their. 2.4 children you know I always feel bad for that 0.4 percent I mean what are they just up to the shin um, <laughs> um but yeah I mean they're so dead set on having these you know kind of textbook biological families that we're missing out on this great opportunity to to take on kids and love kids who've come from really hard backgrounds and and part of the issue here is as christians we we're so we we live in such isolated ways that we're not living as community such that when a when a family thinks of taking on an adopted child they think oh i can't take that on myself but if we christians lived more communal lives then children could be shared in a far obviously not shared totally they a child should always come under one family head one mother and one father but but you know that burden can be shared and yeah i mean much much work much work to be done there in i think it was in 20 i think it was in 2015 of the 200,000 abortions that happened that year there's only 92 adoptions under the age of 1 hmm. I mean, yeah, adoption culture has to change as well. So Christian, we've we've sort of come to the end of our our time, but before you go, I if you could sort of point people in the right right direction. If people have listened to this and they say, oh, "Look, this I'm sort of becoming this this has really brought a new perspective to me. I want to get involved. How can I help? How what can I do? Uh, could you point us in the right direction?" Absolutely. I mean, the first thing is the first, I was reading Nehemiah this week. For those of you who haven't read Nehemiah, it's a book lodged into the Old Testament about a, a Jewish man in exile in Babylon. And he basically worked as the security advisor for the king, for this very powerful king, Artaxerxes. And some people come to him from his homeland and they tell him about the city where he was born and they tell him about how that city is doing. And they tell him that the walls of the city are burnt down and it's just the city is in a total place of disrepair and shame and abandonment and Nehemiah's first response isn't to act isn't to kind of quickly send us some emails or to send us some texts his first response is to fast and to pray to commit this great injustice to the Lord to allow his heart to be broken by it and if you're listening to this praise God for you thanks for listening to this but but I don't we don't need people to get involved suddenly and then to get discouraged and then never see them again we we need people to have their hearts deeply broken by this issue we need people to engage with the facts to hear of the reality of abortion and and first of all just be broken by it and convicted to the core as to how big an issue this is so so my first request would be listen to this get together pray about this issue read the scripture see what the lord says about it because unless you're convicted you're never going to have the batteries to be able to act upon it in a sustained way that we need to change it as to what you do next fortunately there aren't many pro-life organizations out there in the uk there's a handful some of them were formed by catholics our one is non-christian so we we, we accept people from all or no faith backgrounds although much of our leadership is christian but you can join a street display. You can put, get part of our awakening tour. Sean um, is visiting the awakening tour in, in Manchester, I believe. So they can come along to that. You can start working out where abortion is happening closest to you. You can start witnessing to the fact of abortion and uh, near to where you are. If you can persuade your parents to adopt, you can write some letters to MPs. You can get live on social media and you can start engaging with people on social media on this issue. Um, you will be shot at, you will be maligned, but if there's enough of you and if you're loving enough and consistent enough and compassionate enough, then we will see the social media debate change. So those are just a few, yeah, a few options. Have your heart broken, first of all. Let this lead you to prayer and then basically speak to Sean and work out where you think the best way to to, to start fighting this is. Of course, we would love to see your abort 67, we'd love to, but yeah, but first be convicted that this is an issue. Yeah, and, and keep it gospel centered. Point people to the Savior. Yeah. There's the, Jesus Christ is the only hope in this dreadful yeah. environment. So I just want to end by uh, reading First uh, John chapter four verses twenty to twenty one. He says, "If someone says I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? 
And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Yeah. So if you're saying you're a Christian, this isn't something you can be passive about. If you're saying you're a Christian, this isn't something you can be apathetic about. If you can't love humans whom you have seen, it is impossible to love God whom you have not seen. So I want to encourage you with that. And Christian, thank you so much for for joining us. Well, thank, thanks to Sarah for sharing her personal testimony about how she's been treated. I mean, that's very powerful. I mean, and especially we need more doctors and midwives to be informed and live on this but yeah thanks so much for listening thanks for having me i hope i spoke some sense thank you so much for joining and listening to that i i personally have a, a struggle with this area i i, I must always remember and in, in james it says that we're to be slow to speak quick to hear and slow to wrath because the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of god and there's something there's an indignation there's a zeal that sort of wells up within me that's why i've sort of been hesitant to uh, really speak about this publicly to a great degree myself because I find I can end up sinning or hating those who murder children when really there needs to be grace and compassion showed to all people. You know, Paul, the apostle, murdered Christians and Christ saved them. So for those who are murdering children or who are calling for the murder of children, it is so easy for God to save those people and to draw them into his kingdom and we mustn't forget that that uh, these enemies of ours uh, potentially can become our brothers and sisters and we need to love them and show compassion to them and be gentle and gracious with them I hope you after listening to this can understand that we don't want to downplay the sinfulness of sin we want to we want to speak truthfully as Christians. We're we're obligated to speak the truth, and calling it anything other than the murder of a child is the lie. Essentially, to say that it's a termination of a pregnancy, it's, it's the killing of a fetus, is really to downplay the sinfulness of sin. If we if we downplay the sinfulness of sin, we are ultimately robbing Christ of the glory of the cross. The cross does not seem as spectacular as wonderful that it truly is if we downplay the sinfulness of sin. I hope that you will think about that. And we understand that people listening who disagree with us on this topic might be taking great offense at being called a murderer, or they might severely oppose some of the tactics that Christians share that they, that they do, like graphic images. And what we want to help you see is that we're not saying these things because we hate you on the contrary it's because we love you and it's an uncomfortable topic people even those who are calling for abortion don't even like to talk about the fate of the unborn Mm. they don't even like to talk about the process they don't even like to talk about the procedures how abortions are performed what will happen to the baby once it's it's killed they don't want to face a reality of what they're calling for because it's so horrid they somehow in their minds have detached quote-unquote women's choice or the quote-unquote right to abort your child with the reality of what will happen to that unborn baby and you need to think about this you need to think about what you're calling for and that includes the church It's so easy to embrace comfy Christianity Mm. and a Christianity where we're not challenged, where we can... We're respectable. Exactly. Respectable. As Christians, we really need to face the reality of abortion. We need to, as Christians said, be broken and we need to face what it really is. We, We have to be on the right side of history in this issue. And it needs to start with me. It needs to start on an individual basis where we need to surrender to God. We need to stare abortion in the face for what it really is. And we need to do something about it. We need to take the unpopular path and we have to pick up our crosses and deny ourselves. When you do hopefully stare abortion in the face for what it truly is, look to Christ. Don't just look at abortion. Look past it to Christ. So so much wickedness happens in this world and it can be easy to become discouraged but we must firstly remember God redeemed us he saved us he can save others and one day he will vindicate he will 
bring justice in the world. He will vindicate the lives of the unborn. And uh, we must remember that. As Titus chapter 3 reminds us, it says to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So to keep that in mind when engaging on this issue, I want to give you an update for the Armory board game before we wrap things up completely. I've been looking at manufacturing the game. So yes, no more printouts. The game will be in a proper box. You'll be able to order and pay for. However, so exciting. when designing the game, I didn't have manufacturing in mind. So it means that the game would cost a lot to manufacture. So I've been seeking to reduce costs. And one way of doing that is having a lot of components on the website that people can access online. So when they're playing, they can open up their phone and they can look at some of the questions and look at some of the things that are needed in order to play the game, which would greatly reduce manufacturing costs. Some one very exciting ideas. So one thing I'm, I'm working on currently is getting the player UIs, which is sort of determines how many points each player has and what armor they have and how strong they are and how they're progressing, what abilities they can do. Trying to implement all of that on the website so that you have sliders that you can actually move on the on the web and you can hit buttons that put on gear the issue is this isn't my area of expertise i'm not a programmer so i'm currently trying to learn action script and how can i implement this in the website otherwise i i would have to employ a freelance programmer and i've i've asked around got some quotes and it's going to cost about 200 or 100 150 or 200 pounds to hire a programmer so that's something you want to see be implemented quickly uh, there is a, a page on the armory under the games tab uh, under player tools there's a button to donate for that specific uh, cause if you want to see that come quickly otherwise it's going to you know take a while until I, I learn the skill and I can actually implement this myself and obviously that all speeds up the manufacturing process because once this is done I can then work on actually manufacturing the game and getting it into your hands so that you can play at home uh, with a professional quality uh, product so and something that will last a long time and generations so not offering any perks at the moment it's just because there's still a lot to work out and I don't want to offer things that I can't deliver but I certainly seek to compensate those who who do, who do donate I will you know keep a record of your your emails and a record of uh, those type of things and uh, I could seek to compensate you in the future but um just want to keep you updated on that and if you could keep the whole project in prayer it's a lot of work that still needs to be done and I, I really hope that can bless you and your family in the near future god willing so thank you yeah we would just ask you to pray about the topic of abortion uh, we hope that this is challenged and encouraged you share it with friends or family who are on the fence about this topic or you know, we really just need to bring this issue to prayer. It starts with the individual. It starts with us. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us. And may God keep you and bless you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.